clock is at. Yep. Uh, yep. So Stephanie, if you want to let us go live and just let us know when we're ready, it usually takes a couple seconds there. Yes, we'll do. Thank you. Okay, you're live. Thank you, uh, committee. It's uh, five o'clock and uh, time to get started. Uh, this is the Development and Operations Standing Committee. Uh, I'll start with the uh, land acknowledgement. Today we acknowledge that Collingwood is located on the traditional territory of the Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, including traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee and Ojibwe peoples, and on lands connected with the Lake Simcoe Nottawasaga Treaty of 1818. This is the home of a diverse range of Indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. And with that, I will ask uh, for the adoption of the agenda. And that is moved by Councillor Hamlin and seconded by Mayor Saunderson that the content of the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee agenda for January 11th be adopted as presented. And I will ask uh, for a show of hands or cards on that. Okay, thank you. And this is my card. My apologies. Should have had my cards out. There we go. I can't even find mine. <laughs> I beg your pardon? Anyway, uh, so let's uh, move on then to declarations of pecuniary interest. Uh, are there any? Okay, seeing none, uh, I will move on. Is there business arising from our previous meeting? Okay, uh, seeing none. Um, we will move on then to staff reports. And our first staff report this evening is PW 2021-01, Ontario Water Wastewater Agency Response Network. And I will turn this over to uh, Ma Manager McGinnity, I assume. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep, just waiting for the slides to come up, perfect. So um, speaking to Onwarn, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has prompted environmental services staff to take a closer look at our emergency planning within our division. And while we think we've done a good job with prioritizing tasks and scheduling work to minimize the risk of a COVID outbreak within our group, we feel there is an opportunity to improve our access to equipment, contractor and staffing resources in the event of any emergency within water or wastewater. ONWARN, or the Ontario Water Wastewater Agency Response Network, is one such to tool that staff believe would significantly improve the water and wastewater team's ability to respond quickly in an emergency. So next slide. ONWARN is a voluntary network of utilities helping other utilities within Ontario to respond to and recover from emergencies. In the last 20 years, various WARN programs have been implemented or, or are being developed in states across the U.S. by the American Waterworks Association, as well as, as in provinces across Canada. So the primary purpose of a WARN system is to enable municipalities or utilities to provide mutual aid while preparing for and responding to interruptions in water and wastewater services that result from natural or man-made disasters. In the event of an emergency, the WARN program is one tool in the toolbox for responding to and dealing with significant emergencies that are beyond the immediate capacity of the utility. So this is especially beneficial when there is a community-wide, county-wide, or greater emergency where a given utility, utility can be more self-sufficient. And with the WARN program, there is no requirement for the water or wastewater emergency to be correlated to an emergency under Ontario's Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, or EMCPA. Next slide. 
Section 19 of the Safe Drinking Water Act requires that the owner of the drinking water system exercise a level of care and diligence and skill with respect to the municipal drinking water system that a reasonably prudent person would be expected to exercise in a similar situation and to act honestly, competently, and with integrity with a view to ensuring the protection and safety of the users of the municipal drinking water system. Participation in OnWarn would ensure that town staff is that the town is giving staff another route to access critical resources to promptly respond to an emergency situation and to help ensure an uninterrupted supply of safe drinking water can be provided to customers of the town of Collingwood drinking water system. It is also encouraged by both provincial and federal agencies. Next slide. The town recently entered into a mutual aid agreement with the County of Simcoe and lower tier municipalities and First Nations within the county. This is an excellent the tool that the town could have used to access resources needed while there was an active state of emergency in Ontario in 2020. However, staff cannot rely upon this agreement if access to these resources was required once a state of emergency ceased to be in effect. When the reopening Ontario, a flexible response to COVID-19 Act came into effect on July 24th, 2020. One of the key benefits of OnWarn over this existing mutual aid agreement is that the town could access the network of water wastewater utility resources without the declaration of a state of emergency. It would also provide the town with access to a province-wide network of resources instead of only those located within the county of Simcoe. Next slide. While there are no financial obligations associated with participating in OnWarn, there is an expectation that the town would keep resources ready state maintain an up-to-date list of resources, respond to calls for assistance when able, noting that this is not obligatory, support responding members when we make a request for assistance, and keep our costs reasonable when we do respond to requests for support. Next slide. Some examples, while well, a more exhaustive list is included in the report that was prepared, um, a brief highlights of some that have been uh, where the OnWarn network has been called upon was with the City of Guelph requesting contractor support with a large and deep water main break repair that was beyond the expertise of their staff or existing contractor list. Uh, Sudbury requesting access to thawing equipment during occasion of extensive frozen water services and Smith Falls requesting access to in-stock communication cards that are critical for their data communications. Next slide. And that's all. So thank you so much for the opportunity to present and for your consideration of our request. Thanks very much, Heather. Uh, first, I will turn to um, the clerk to inquire whether there are any um, members of the public participating this evening and if they have any questions or comments in regard to this staff report. Um, I do have one member's hand up. Uh, Mr. Pretty would like to speak to this matter. So I will just get him going here. Um, it will work. I had to promote him as a panelist because of his connection here. So. Hi, everyone. Good. There we are. I'm at home. And uh, we can hear I'm, you loud and clear. I wonder, like, if, if the water system freezes, should we tell the general public to buy spring water at one of the many food lands we have in town so that they ready themselves in case we're under attack by anything? So the on Warren system, you know, we have a back up you know if we are under attack with something I, I don't know you know if it's always possible we could be under attack uh what does the, the specialist say with regards to having a good stockpile of of bottled water in the garage uh, uh i will uh ask uh manager mcginnity or uh director slama to uh respond to that question thank you availability of water in the... Yeah, uh, it's always possible. We could be under attack in some strange way. You know, it, it could happen at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Through the Chair to uh, Mr. Pretty. So um, in the past, when we, we have had some situations in Collingwood where 
some of our water supply was limited. We have, we have been able to, as long as our distribution system isn't compromised, we do have some locations in town where we're able to um, oh, yeah. pro provide a place where that residents can go and, and access water at our yep. reservoirs. And then we've also used some other tools like our quench buggy, mm -hmm. right? If it's a situation where we oh, need, yeah. need, maybe Trap. need to get water from another place and um, yeah. the quench buggy can be used as a tool to oh, yeah. um, provide water that people could, could come and get water to. Yeah. Um, you, you know, we certainly, we operate mm -hmm. to uh, limit the amount of times that we would have to, uh, we would not have any water available through our distribution system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to know. There's there are there are secondary sources for water if if we have a higher level crisis right now. I guess we're at a level of gray. If we ever reach you know full on red crisis, if we're under attack, uh, we can go to those locations to get water. Is that correct? So through the chair. So like at this time, like mm -hmm. there our distribution system and our treatment plan is, is, um, is working a hundred percent. So we have, yeah. So we have no limitations to our supply of water right now for our residents, yeah. right. And what they expect every day. Yeah. Um, so we'd be notified by radio if we had to go to those locations, if there was a full shutdown, you know, we would go to those locations with our, you know, containers, whatever types of containers we have. If we're fully under attack right now, I think we're under like low level attack, but like full attack, that would really be terrible. Okay, uh, Director Slama. Yeah, through the chair. So I think certainly we would have uh, various ways of communicating with the public on um, the best way to get their potable water. And we would, we would for sure be assisting with that. Thank you. Uh, any further questions, Mr. Pretty? Um, I guess the main thing is, is just knowing that I, th I think the fact that we don't want to scare the public in the, in the thought that we're under fully attack, but I think we are under attack in one way. It's just, do we know that those are available sources of water in case there's other biological attacks, you know, that are this variant virus, like that's just, yeah, it's just on and on and on. I, I, I really think a lot of people are, are uh, quite uh, confused and, and probably quite frightened, to tell you the truth. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Slama. Yes, yeah, so through the chair, I just would like to reassure the public, right, that in our situation today, our, our, uh, distrib our potable water system is not compromised today, even though uh, we are dealing with um, the COVID-19 virus. Great, thank you. Uh, is there any other member of the public uh, wishing to make comment? Uh, Deputy Clerk. Um, if there's anyone else that's wishing to speak tonight, if you could pre please press the raise your hand uh, button and uh, we'll allow you to speak on this item. And there's no other hands raised, so that will be it for the public consultation and for the staff report. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, committee, I'll uh, read out the motion and uh, then we'll turn it over to yourselves for discussion. Uh, so um, moved by Mayor Saunderson and seconded by Deputy Mayor Hull, that staff report PW 2021-01, Ontario Water Wastewater Agency Response Network or ONWARN be received and that council authorize the execution of the agreement, including future amendments with Ontario Water Wastewater Agency Response Network. Uh, committee, questions or comments? Councillor Hamlin. Uh, thank you, I just have a com comment, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm just uh, think this would be a very prudent thing for the municipality to do, to have the ability to share uh, resources with other like-minded municipalities in emergency situations. And thank you to staff for bringing this uh, forward to us. I'm obviously fully in support. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Mayor Saunderson. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I also am in support of this. It makes uh, uh, an abundance of sense to me, particularly to be able to access assistance when they're not in a state of emergency. But just looking at uh, the numbers here through you to either Manager McGinnity or Director Salama, it says that there are currently 59 uh, municipalities across the province that are members. It seems to me that there, there should be more. I'm just wondering if there's, if it's uh, growing in popularity or why it is that we're at numbers where we are. Director Salama? Sorry. Uh, I'll let Manager McGinnity um, speak to that if I could, uh, Madam Chair. Very good, go ahead. Yes, through you, Madam Chair. So this is a relatively new initiative, like if in terms of uh, the scope of things. So it really started in the States, we said about 20 years ago, and it's really only come to Canada in the past 10 years. So there's been a lot of promotion of it. Um, there had to be a lot of groundwork laid in the first initial years, getting some key municipalities to participate. And I think they're starting to see more municipalities sign on to it. And I'm certain through this COVID pandemic that we're going to be seeing even more. Um, but I do know that uh, locally, Town of Blue Mountains is a, is a member as well as Clearview. So there, are, there is some local representation as well. That's good to know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Chair Doherty. I guess my only comment was noting that in the report that Peterborough had stipulated a response uh, radius or limit, if you would, to one hour. But I, I think and I don't understand, I'm assuming we didn't consider that, but if, if you're, there's no, it's not obligatory and you would only restrict your resources maybe by uh, limiting that. So I was just wondering what the explanation was with that. I guess it's through Manager McGinnity. Okay, uh, Manager McGinnity. Through you, Madam Chair. I couldn't say specifically why. I agree with you that it seems to limit what they'd be able to access. Um, maybe they're a larger municipality, so they didn't feel that they needed to, to go beyond um, the one hour radius in order to, to get additional staffing resources. But I think for our pers from my perspective, um, because we are a small municipality and if there is a local outbreak, say, for example, of, you know, the COVID in our community, Town of Blue Mountains, like we'd want to be looking further than our neighbours to pull in support um, from a staffing perspective. And also some of these larger municipalities, which are more than an hour away, have a lot more stock of um, equipment and supplies that we could call on and ask for assistance if needed. So I, I, don't, I don't recommend that we limit it um, for ourselves. Thank, Thank you. you. Anything further, Councillor Jeffrey? Okay. Uh, Okay, I had a couple of uh, questions um, that occurred to me, um, re just that weren't clear um, after reading the MOU. So if I may, I'd just like to pose them. Um, the first uh, was um, relative to specific costs uh, covered by the requesting municipality. And I was thinking of a situation where uh, we may loan one of our staff uh, to a requesting municipality. Um, they may have accrued X number of hours uh, with us uh, in a particular week. And uh, then they move uh, to the requesting municipality and contribute X number of hours there such that in total, their hours would be over um, a regular work week and they would be um, um, subject to overtime. So I'm just wondering if that is the case and if so, who pays the overtime? Uh, I guess manager- I can Gennady. respond if you'd like. <laughs> so okay. yes. As part of the um, part of the agreement, it we would be able to recover all costs associated with um, that response. So, if they're being paid overtime, um, and in terms of their employment contract with the town and the number of hours and working more than their regularly scheduled hours, then we would be able to recover those overtime costs from the the other municipality. Okay, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, a second question was um, the uh, payment terms. Uh, and the MOU states that the requesting member may pay within 45 days. Uh, now, in the case of this municipality, um, we charge interest on any invoice over 30 days due. Um, and so I'm wondering, would there be then financial costs or financing costs rather that the municipality is absorbing or would we pass those on or how would that be handled? So through you, Madam Chair, um, I did follow up with finance on this to try to get some clarification. And yes, you are correct that we typically have a 30 day payment turnaround and start charging interest following the 30 day period. Uh, however, if um, in this situation, because it's relating to water wastewater, I don't expect, and because of the depth of our reserves that are available, I don't expect that we would have, and finance confirmed, that we would have any financial charges or financing charges associated with any payment beyond that 30-day window. So a 40-day payment window is satisfactory from, my persp from our perspective. Great. Thank you. And then just uh, one final question. Um, would there be any increased general insurance costs to the town uh, by virtue of our participation in this program? And I'm thinking of insurance costs over and above uh, workmen's uh, compensation uh, insurance cost. So Madam, yes, Madam Chair. So that's again, another question I have followed up with uh, our deputy clerk on. So based on our initial response from our insurance, we don't expect that there would be any additional costs associated with um, change, any changes to the insurance policy that we would have to, to make as part of the requirements of the agreement, but we are waiting for confirmation on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I. Uh, uh, definitely concur with the rest of the committee that um, I'm very much in support of this uh, proposal and certainly any resources that we can avail ourselves of uh, when it comes to our water and wastewater is, is uh, worth pursuing. Uh, so um, if there are no further questions and I will uh, call the vote all in favor of the recommendation to authorize the agreement. And that is carried unanimously. Thank you. Our second uh, staff report is uh, P2021-01, extension of draft approval for a plan of subdivision regional commercial district. Uh, with Dunn Capital Corporation and 2204604 Ontario, Inc. And I will uh, turn that presentation over to Director Farr. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Good evening, members of the committee. Uh, this will be a, a relatively brief presentation. This, uh, this uh, report deals with a uh, proposed extension of uh, draft plan approval conditions for uh, lands known as the Regional Commercial District. Next slide, please. These uh, are lands more or less uh, southwest of the intersection of uh, High Street and First Street or Mountain Road. Um, they encompass 21 hectares. Uh, next slide, please. And include a number of uh, blocks. Uh, there's four commercial and uh, one industrial block a street block and some environmental blocks in and around the river. So this is a, a complex uh, and significant uh, a subdivision within the town's uh, built boundary dealing with non-residential developments. So it's of significant importance in terms of the town's overall um, uh, growth uh, uh, plan and uh, represents, uh, I guess, a, a, a significant non-residential chunk of land. Um, and uh, staff uh, are uh, recommending that this uh, set of draft plan conditions be approved for four months to allow some more detailed to, uh, work to occur on this, um, at which time we'll come back with a more uh, a detailed report and any uh, uh, changes if applicable uh, for your consideration. I'm glad to answer any questions. Very good. Thank you, Director Farr. 
Uh, are there any members in the public who wish to make comment uh, in regard to this staff report? Mm -hmm. Deputy Clerk? Uh, Chair Doherty, I have uh, Matthew Pretty wishing to speak on this item, so I'll just let him in again. Thank you. Hey everyone, I turned my volume down. Uh, this is a big deal right here. Um, the section of town is very interesting. That was talked about last year about the um, is it Columbia, no Cambridge, Cambridge, Cambridge Road extension to third, the third street bicycle path, redo of third, high street. This, this is a key piece of property. Um, to be fair, regarding roads and paths, um, I'm sure there's going to be great, great buildings, you know, set up in this area. I heard there might be a roundabout in that section, uh, plazas and possible uh, residential high rise. That would be good to see. I love what's going on over at Peel and Collins, those four story, the Duncap uh, Realty Group, uh, the Harbor will be very exciting to see. Question for Director of Planning um, in, a, in, a, in, in good tone and good spirit. Will there be a bridge going across Black Ash River? When will we see the Cambridge Road extension and then the uh, road work needed on High Street in conjunction with this development? Obviously, this is a Duncap Realty property. This is a big deal. Uh, when will we see road work in that respect uh, done to accommodate these business enterprises that would be going in through this multi-block area that's not just industrial it is an industrial area uh, the view is exceptional obviously uh, you know in the wake of going west and looking west when would we see that process unfold would this be a four-year plan a three-year plan uh, you know two years uh, how would that land shape up with regards to plugging in what's necessary for the the business side to to uh, be developed. That's my question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Director Farr. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Mr. Pretty. Uh, so the, the applicant in this case has requested the extension to provide some more time to uh, identify uh, potential tenants for the proposed blocks. Uh, presumably, they'd want some uh, greater certainty around their tenanting of the area before they uh, finalize the infrastructure planning for the site as a whole. Uh, so uh, that, that, that's my understanding. They have uh, worked uh, through the conditions to some extent to uh, provide some information on the, on the technical details of the roadway, but uh, effectively with their extension request, they're seeking more time to enable themselves greater certainty to proceed with uh, development. And I can't say right now uh, exactly what that time frame would be in which development will occur. May I follow up, Chair Doherty? Uh, yes, yes, you may, just Matthew. Briefly, um, I think I just heard what the director said. There's no set timeline. Um, what would his, his assumption be? Like, would they start developing the harbor first or would they do that section first or would they do both at the same time? Like this development company in the old Cinema 4 near the museum, like they seem like a pretty big deal. I see the, the building as is, this uh, Duncap Realty Group. What timeline could this company, uh, you know, uh, put this together in a, in a way that's sort of fast and there's a nice energy about it versus sort of, oh, this is going to take 20 years to build. Like, you know, could we, could we say five years is a, uh, you know, is um, five, five years or less? Director Farr? Oh, three, Madam Chair, Mr. Pretty, there's a, there's a quite a bit of opportunity in uh, Collingwood, as everyone I think is generally aware that's uh, emerging. And people's views and perspectives on the development of their lands uh, seem to be changing as the months go by. So whereas uh, it's not clear right now whether or not uh, Duncap will pursue uh, the development of their lands in the harbor at any given time, um, on all of these lands it would depend upon um, a development interest. Um, I, I'm assuming time will tell. Uh, they had originally asked uh, for a uh, five-year extension here, which presumably gave them a great deal of latitude to consider uh, what the opportunities might be. Staff are uh, considering the term of that uh, request. 
and, uh, and, and we'll uh, speak to it further when we come back in, uh, in four months with any uh, uh, further recommendations. Thank you, Director. Okay, uh, are there any other members of the public wishing to comment? If there's anyone else in the audience that would like to speak to this matter, if you could please raise your hand. And there is no other hands raised, so uh, public participation for this item is now closed. Uh, thank you, Deputy Clerk. Okay, I will uh, read in the motion then. Um, that staff oh, moved by Deputy Mayor Hull and seconded by Councillor Jeffrey. That staff report P2021-01, extension of draft approval for a plan of subdivision, regional commercial district, Dunn Capital Corporation and 2204604 Ontario Inc be received and that council extend the draft approval for the proposed regional commercial district plan of subdivision for a further four months or until June 8th, 2021. And that council direct staff to continue their review of the draft approval and bring forward further recommendation report dealing with the development proposal prior to the June 8th, 2021 lapse date. Members of the committee, are there any comments or questions? Councillor Hamlin, and followed by Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have no problem with the recommendation of staff this evening. Um, I do have a question for Director Farr, and um, my concerns and my question have nothing to do with the development that's proposed, but are directed to the traffic impacts of this project. Um, the traffic report that was submitted originally by the developer for this project uh, is based on traffic work that the town did almost 10 years ago. Uh, and so my first question is uh, whether in considering uh, for their future report, staff will be uh, looking at the base traffic documents uh, for this development. Director Farr. All three, Madam Chair, Councillor Hamlin. Um, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and so in looking at that traffic report and I refresh my uh, memory this morning, um, you know, what that report does also is highlight the issue of Third Street and my continuing concerns about Third and every other residential street in our community is that they maintain their residential character and their neighborhood functions. Um, and what this re traffic report the developer had commissioned shows is that the road that will go through this development um, will come out at Third and High and it will function to divert a third of the traffic coming along mountain heading towards the lights at first and high. Uh, it will divert a third of that traffic down through their project and come out at what will be lights at high and third. And I think the reason that was probably contemplated as a potentially okay thing is that third is shown as a collector road uh, in our official plan. Uh, a collector road being, uh, you know, a road that would be functioning uh, to collect traffic, spit it out at arterial roads, and generally wouldn't have access from driveways onto it, which of course, uh, some would argue, including me, third doesn't really function and never has as a collector road. We learned about two years ago when some residents came forward that our uh, former uh, director of uh, Engineering and Public Works, uh, he informed us that the town ha was busy uh, securing a corridor of land to make sure that third extended to the west uh, as far as 10th and would go through out to Pretty River Parkway. So I have uh, my question arising out of all these facts as I understand them. Uh, is whether um, the impact on our uh, community that lives south of first and east of high will be looked at in the context uh, of the traffic impacts uh, through any review that you're doing. 
Director Farr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I can just say generally uh, right now that uh, we need more time to review these conditions. And we were reviewing the conditions to make sure that they were relevant in uh, our current circumstances. These are five or six years old right now. So they'll be uh, circulated and uh, attention will be drawn to the conditions uh, among all the commenting departments and agencies, including uh, town engineering. So uh, I, I, I guess that, that's the sort of short answer, unless uh, uh, Director Slama has anything that you'd like to answer now. However, I would say that the intent is to uh, look at them in their entirety and uh, we will be mindful of this question and then uh, address this uh, when it uh, comes back in whatever form or fashion. But uh, I'll just pause and, uh, and uh, note that, uh, that I see Director Slam's uh, camera is on and if she has anything to add, invite her to do so through the chair. Thank you, Director Slama. Yeah, I'll just support uh, what Director Farr has, has stated that we will, you know, be doing a fulsome report and we, we will give some consideration to, um, you, you know, uh, or when we're reviewing, right, the uh, engineering elements with respect to traffic and movement of traffic to, you know, any more recent data that we have. But, um, you know, I think that, you know, Third Street is is identified as a collector road and um, and that does remain that way when we look at some of our master plans, but um, when you speak to uh, securing the access through to 10th, so I believe that yes, Manager Velik is, is looking at that and, and making sure that those options are open and just giving other considerations, right? When, as we look at this uh, development again. Okay, lots more to be said on this project. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Oh, sorry, Councillor Jeffrey, I did have you. Yep, no problem at all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think mine is probably, the question is just an expanded uh, concept of what um, Councillor Hamlin has brought off, just brought up. But usually at times when there's um, extensions or um, things open up a bit, it does give us an opportunity to revisit and, um, make sure if staff have any druthers in terms of moving forward with with uh, the applicant. So do we lose that opportunity by doing uh, the extension outright for four months? Or I think I'm hearing that there's lots of opportunity going forward because um, there's a, you know, a few years, a lot of years have gone by with that planning and probably a lot of things we need to just double check. So are we losing that opportunity by simply granting the extension? Director Farr. Well, through you, Madam Chair, Councillor Jeffrey, uh, staff committed uh, as a result of comments, previous uh, committee meetings to look at uh, extensions of draft plan approval more closely. Uh, the effect of this extension is uh, to provide a, a short amount of time for staff to review this in greater detail. As I indicated earlier, it's a, it's a complex and it's a large uh, a subdivision. The applicants themselves have indicated that they need more time to uh, identify potential tenants and in my view, I think probably explore where they're going with this uh, piece of property in more detail. So in our view of uh, the extension is a, a sufficiently short amount of time to allow staff to review it without, uh, with, I guess with minimal risk that uh, uh, any issues emerging from the existing conditions would somehow pop up. We, we don't see that that's the case or does that appear to be the intent of the applicant. So, uh, so uh, that, that, that's implicit in our recommendation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, seeing none, then I will call the vote uh, to uh, receive this uh, recommendation. All in favor? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay, uh, next item is reports and minutes of other committees. Uh, we have the uh, Nautilusaga board highlights for December 11th, 2020. Are there any uh, questions or comments from anyone in the audience this evening? 
Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? Okay, uh, then um, I will, um, sorry, I should have uh, read the motion first. So that would be moved by Councillor Jeffrey and seconded by Councillor Hamlin that the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority board meeting highlights dated December 11th, 2020 be received. And I'll call the vote, all in favor. And that's carried unanimously. Okay, then we're moving on then to the consent agenda. And we have uh, five items. Uh, we have um, a notification from Ministry of Transportation on uh, safe restart agreement phase two funding from October 2020 to March 2021. Uh, correspondence from the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, uh, the 2020 Minister's annual drinking water report. Correspondence from the City of St. Catharines, uh, development approval requirements for landfills. Correspondence from Debbie France uh, in regard to a federal cannabis petition. And finally, uh, correspondence from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs on uh, a safe restart funding allocation. Okay, are there, um, before I uh, pull any of these items, are there any questions or comments? Okay, are there any items that uh, members of the committee would like to pull? Councillor Jeffrey and then Councillor Hamlin. Uh, 7.1 and 7.5. Okay, very good. Uh, Councillor Hamlin. I also wanted 7.1. Okay, excellent. Uh, I also um, have a question uh, in regard to uh, 7.4 and 7.5. Uh, so, Councillor Jeffrey. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question would be um, through to the CAO and or our new uh, director, um, Quinlan. Um, just regarding the uh, budget process we just came through versus um, the funding notification. I, I think I do recall a message issued by the CAO um, recommending against um, the impacts of this on the budget, but I'm wondering what the government thinks, thinks in terms of sending emergency operating funding, if you will, because that's exactly what the safe restart money is in terms of not having to use it in the year in which you incurred the expenses and um, so I was just wondering how that's going to roll out. It's not, I'm not, I don't think anything's going to be changed, but I just want to have a better understanding as to how that worked. Okay, CAO Skinner. Thank you, Chair Doherty. Through you to Councillor Jeffrey and uh, the, our, our new uh, Treasurer uh, Quinlan may want to make uh, some comment, but it being her first day, I'll take the first stab at it. Um, so uh, yes, the money has been provided in, uh, there's two letters actually in this correspondence agenda, one for transit in particular and, and one for other, uh, other operating pressures. And it is specified that some of the money is available for uh, the past year that's just finished 2020. And some of it is available into 2021. And it is to be used specifically for costs incurred in those years. Um, However, uh, the pieces that were in 2020, of course, wouldn't have been subject to our budget deliberations um, that we just completed for 2021. Uh, and the 2021 pieces, uh, we were not entirely sure, given that we had just uh, received notice or were starting to receive notice that we might go into a, into a lockdown situation or a little bit different than the assumptions we'd made in the budget, um, uh, that we should, uh, be moving immediately at the time of budget to incorporate those uh, those funding in our the funding from the province in our analysis. But at now, as we uh, we go through these first few uh, weeks and the month or two into 2021, we will be keeping uh, SIC and Council uh, closely updated on on what's happening with this funding, so that we can in fact use it within the parameters. Um, 
uh, that are set out in these letters. Thank you. And I, thank you. Thank you, CAO. Uh, and uh, Director Quinlan, anything to add? Hi there, yes. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So <laughs> uh, just through to Councillor Jeffrey. So the, um, the funding, and I think that if in the letter they do state that it'll help us at least accrue for the revenue that was provided for 2020. So it will be included in the financial statements when we close out 2020 as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Hamlin. Uh, thank you. Um, our CEO's response uh, covered a question I wanted to ask, so I don't have one. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And actually, our CAO's response also uh, covered my question in uh, 7.5. Um, <clears throat> I did uh, just want to uh, ask um, the mayor and deputy mayor, though, uh, in regard to the uh, federal cannabis petition, I understand that uh, most of the issues that uh, Ms. Uh, France has alluded to um, are not relevant to this municipality, uh, but notwithstanding the county had brought forward a resolution in November uh, in regard to uh, cannabis uh, and the federal regulations. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that uh, somewhat. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. If the um, uh, resolution you're referring to, I think might have emanated from uh, Clearview Township uh, relating to uh, the federal uh, medical marijuana regime and the ability of individuals to get prescriptions uh, through their physicians for uh, uh, an amount of uh, personally grown plants and then the ability to assign those uh, prescriptions to other third party growers. Uh, so I know that the Clear, uh, Clearview Township has uh, gone on record with respect to that, uh, asking the federal government to uh, rethink that. Uh, and that's what came through uh, County Council, if, uh, if I understand your question. Uh, we have not had any response, and I don't believe any further steps have been taken. And I don't know if the Deputy Mayor has anything he'd like to add to that. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Deputy Mayor? Uh, thank you. No, I, I do not have anything to add to that. Thank you. Okay, then I will uh, call the vote uh, to uh, receive uh, and accept the consent agenda. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Okay, then uh, moving on now to uh, item eight, departmental updates. Uh, and um, we have an update from Director Rib Ridlow uh, and uh, Director Slama, and I believe that um, Director Farr will be uh, making a, a brief update. So go ahead, Director Ridlow. Thank you, Chair Doherty. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to um, the committee today and uh, excuse me, sharing an update on um, the recent Go Get Out campaign, uh, which council approved um, back at the end of July and uh, approved an expenditure of $75,000 for. Um, so today we'd like to go through those results. Next slide, please. The overall objective was to drive a long-term marketing promotional plan that complements our strategic plan to ensure Collingwood remains a top of line four season destination um, and helps the tourism sector in particular get back to business. Now, it was certainly focused on helping shop the neighborhood and ways to enjoy safely given, given what we knew at the time in July. And of course, a lot has changed in the last six months so this campaign has been all about trying to adapt, uh, not monthly, but weekly, to the realities of what is allowed. Uh, a team of local uh, marketing experts came out with the rally call and campaign theme, Go Get Out. Next slide, please. 
The go get out creative concept has the potential to have longer term branding. So we wanted to make sure that we were building something that in theory could continue beyond just COVID. Um, with of course the whole world wordplay around go get out, focusing on getting outside and also being a strong rally call to get active, which of course is a, is a key part of the town's vision of offering a healthy lifestyle of activities in beautiful and safe settings. The Go Get Out campaign celebrates key pillars that support this healthy lifestyle focused on the waterfront, a vibrant downtown, an artful community, and the healthy natural environment that we live in. With four key areas of focus. You wanna just uh, push the button, you'll see uh, one of the slides appear. Um, and it focused on land, next button, food and drink, next button, the water, and of course, the unique shops that, does, that define the downtown and the artful community that we've got here. It's a unique part of this website was the fact that it represents the next generation of promotional programming that engages the community to build the whole story and tell the whole story as opposed to trying to tell the whole story on the website itself. And as you'll notice on each page, there is a hashtag get out calling with the links to our Instagram channel. And the whole idea here was to actually inspire the community to share their stories about what makes Collingwood so special and what are they doing to go get outside and do the best they can in terms of experiencing safe things in town. And of course, this changed over the last six months, what was considered safe. And that is perhaps the toughest part of this campaign, but at the same time has been one of its hallmarks. Importantly, it's a campaign that was locally inspired. It's a campaign that was locally built and it was engaged with by the local community. Next slide. There was also a component to this campaign that relied on activities, safe outdoor activities that once again were adapted to what was appropriate seasonally and based on the COVID restrictions. We launched with the Patio Licious campaign um, and then we proceeded to the craft, Collingwood Craft Beverage Tour. And then the culminating aspect was a puzzle walk challenge. And as I mentioned, each of these were adapted to adhere to the current activities that were allowed at the time. Next slide. In total, the campaign delivered an unprecedented 1.9 million media impressions solely targeted on South Georgian Bay. What that meant was that it kept people aware of what's going on in Collingwood. It kept people aware here of those little gems that exist here that they may not have had a chance to go outside and enjoy. As you can see, we used a number of mediums across the last three months to get this message out there, including Facebook and Instagram posts. We had a team of social media influencers. We used the latest technology in terms of social media ads. Uh, we had uh, several online news portals that supported this. We saw uh, outdoor billboards come in use and we also used radio and public relations to get the message out there. Next slide. In marketing, there's a term that's used uh, called paid media examples or impressions. And these are those that you actually go out there and purchase based on the budget that's available. As you'll see on the following slide, there's also earned media. And that's the opportunity to actually amplify how much is actually available or additional impressions that you can get by working closely with partners that go above and beyond what you've paid for. We achieved a tremendous reach just with the paid media alone including outdoor billboards, videos, the Puzzle Walk app, stories on local media, an extensive social media campaign. The part that I thought really engaged people the most was actually the Puzzle Walk. And it was through unique videos like the one produced by Julie Caden, a local videographer, that I think really told the story of the Puzzle Walks and what it was designed to do as we go through these challenging times. If you can please play the video.
Health Challenge is a fantastic way to go get out in Collingwood safely and responsibly. The best part is it's free to participate. It's part history, part mystery, and all fun. Stick with me and I might just share some secrets. Start by downloading the free Goose Chase app on your mobile device. There are four puzzle walks you can participate in, each with its own game code that can be found on gogetout.com. Enter the code to get started and try your luck at a series of riddles. Puzzles can be completed on foot, outdoors. Please respect social distancing. Okay, here's a clue I can let you in on. In 1905, Mr. William Swain could be seen driving his wagon through the streets of Collingwood. What did he sell? Mr. William Swain was an ice dealer. But keep it between you and me. Riddles are not impossible to solve, but some require more brain power than others, which is why it's best to complete a walk with your immediate bubble. More brains are better than one. Each puzzle uncovers a keyword that leads you to the final answer. All the while, you'll be discovering the many ways you can go get out in Collingwood. 2,537 steps later and we have completed our first puzzle walk challenge. Learn more about all the puzzle walks at gogetout.com and participate for free through the Goose Chase app for your chance to win local prizes. Have fun, be safe, and good luck. Thank you very much. On to the next slide, slide seven, uh, with the title Earned uh, Media Engagement. This just summarizes those above and beyond impressions that we got through the uh, passport uh, contest that we ran. We had 40 passports that got submitted and completed through the puzzle walks. We had 667 participants in that, which uh, overachieved our original goal by fourfold. So huge success there. We had uh, Instagram posts. 782 Instagram posts that tag Get Out Collingwood, which is a tribute to the way the community engaged with the whole campaign. And 20,000 engagements in terms of clicks, posts, and comments, such as the one that you see before you. Next slide. One of the final benefits that came out of this campaign was actually earned publicity for Tech Hub North and the promotion of our digital service squad. As it happened to be, when we were working on developing the puzzle walk, we came in touch with Goose Chase, actually through an internal campaign that uh, Dean and the PR, team at PRC ran, and ended up actually being part of a major media release that was released in partnership with Digital Main Street, including a quote by the Associate Minister um, for Industry, as well as our very own Mayor Saunderson, who got quoted in this media release, which I think ties in very well with Collingwood increasingly becoming Tech Hub North. Next slide, please. Go Get Out was part of a much larger effort um, through Experience Collingwood, which is the lifestyle promotion arm that we've been working on over the last five to six years. And it includes posts on our core Facebook and Instagram Experience Collingwood channels as more than 11, uh, more than 11 different campaigns that promote specific initiatives and programs that we all align to. These were done in close collaboration with the communications officer, community partners and suppliers and the town's corporate town of Collingwood social media channels. Next slide, please. These campaigns generated 5.5 million impressions. And what differentiates these campaigns from traditional ads and non-digital media is the ability to actually measure the engagement with the ad as a way of measuring, did they work? And in this case, they sure did work. More than three times better than the industry average. Next slide. In total, Experience Calling provides an incredibly powerful promotional platform. In 2020 alone, it produced 8.4 million impressions across Facebook and Instagram with a reach of 4.3 million people, an engagement of 313,000 and 890 original posts. That means 2.4 posts per day, 365 days a year. Next slide. The overall followership of Experience Collingwood, both on Facebook and Instagram, totals 28,000. That is remarkable for a municipality of our size. Um, and most notably, you'll see that they continue to grow. Facebook, 14%, and Instagram, an amazing 56% uh, 
and Instagram has been a particular growth story as we try to engage more honestly and sincerely with the 20 to 35 audience, which tends to be on Instagram much more. Last slide. I'd like to finish off with a huge thank you to the local team of marketing experts at Wordjack and Screenplay, a team of seven influencers, more than 50 businesses that worked with us to help them help us promote them, and an incredibly supportive community that has frequented our businesses and participated in the various campaigns over the course of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ridlow. Uh, those are indeed excellent results. Standing committee, are there any questions or comments? Uh, Mayor Saunderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I concur, those are uh, spectacular numbers for our community. And uh, I wanna pick up just on uh, the Go Get Out uh, program. Uh, which I think was uh, part of an offshoot of our economic support and recovery task force uh, to sell more now in Collingwood and get people out shopping locally. And, uh, and I want to thank our local businesses for getting on board and being part of that program and for our residents for getting out and supporting it. And uh, finally, I would like to uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, this is your last meeting, I think, as a member of our staff. And I want to thank you for uh, you were our original uh, director uh, or manager of marketing, director of marketing and business development, uh, going back to when it was first opened. And uh, I think you've been here now for seven years and uh, it has been uh, a very successful uh, time for Collingwood and you have shepherded in many great initiatives and have really grown it. And so you're going out on a high note. Uh, I know you're staying here, so we'll see you. Uh, but you'll certainly be missed at Town Hall. So thank you very much, Martin, for all you've done. Through you, Chair Doherty. Thank you very much, Mayor Saunderson. It's been a pleasure. Any, any other questions or comments? Uh, well, I, I will uh, definitely echo um, Mayor Saunderson's comments. Uh, you have made a fantastic uh, contribution, Martin, and uh, the... Uh, the person who will uh, succeed you will have big shoes to fill. That has nothing to do with your shoe size. Um, I just, I do have a question uh, though, just a, a really out of curiosity. Um, so the slogan, go, go get out. So I, I suppose one, one could interpret that could also you know, mean the opposite of get out. And um, so I'm wondering why that uh, particular uh, choice of words for the slogan. Thank you, uh, Chair Doherty. It's a great question. Uh, you know, originally what we wanted to do is tell people to go get outside, um, go walk the trails. At the time, we could still go out and enjoy patios and downtown. They were still out, uh, outside. We knew that outside was a core piece, both for physical and mental health as well. So that was originally what we wanted to go out there and say. Um, but there were a couple of challenges that we ran into uh, in marketing, certainly the shorter, the better. Um, and second of all, when we looked at hashtags and what has been done uh, with the terms, go get outside, outside, um, there are a number of magazines and other publications online and in printed materials that have already used those names. Um, and based on the advice of the team, they advise that there could be some risk with going with something that is too close, particularly something that's going to get fairly significant promotional support. So um, it, certainly there is um, the aspect of those three words that could have a different meaning. Um, and I think that's something that's worth evaluating as we head into 2021 to go, you know, d does it work or are there some challenges where we need to modify that perhaps? Uh, and I think that's an interesting discussion to have with the broader community. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no uh, further questions or comments, uh, then I will move to Director Slama to provide an update on um, transit. Thank you, Chair Doherty. 
Uh, tonight, our um, operations and transit, transit coordinator, Chris Wisniak, is here, and uh, he's going to walk us through a short presentation. Lots of things happening or have been happening with transit over the last uh, six months, and so we wanted to use this as an opportunity to provide the committee and uh, accounts and, and the public an update on some of the things uh, where they stand and also uh, provide some uh, information on what's to come. Go ahead, Chris. I did see him there, that maybe we mm -hmm. lost a connection. Can you hear us, Chris? We can't, yeah, we can't hear you. Uh, Chair Doherty, might I suggest if uh, Director Farr wants to uh, give his presentation, we'll see if we can get um, the uh, audio connection with uh, Mr. Wisniak. Good idea. Uh, Director Farr, are you ready to go? You bet. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a brief announcement uh, about some upcoming public consultation we have scheduled for the official plan update project. At uh, previous meetings, you've heard both our consultants and, uh, and me mentioned our interest in trying to get uh, more input from families and youth in the official plan uh, update. As I'd indicated previously, we were hoping, well, I'm not sure hoping is the right word, but we were planning to spend weekends in the local arenas and at the YMCA to uh, try to uh, meet with people uh, where they were gathering. But with the pandemic, unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that. So we've set up a, a special day with a couple of sessions, uh, one at uh, one o'clock uh, targeted at families of all makes and varieties and uh, for uh, youth at four o'clock. Uh, we have all the registration information available on the town's uh, Engage Collingwood page. Engage Collingwood is the town's kind of clearinghouse for all current initiatives. And on Engage Collingwood, there's an official plan update page. So if you simply uh, type into, the, into your favorite search engine, Engage Collingwood official plan update, the first box that residents will see is an invitation to register for one of the sessions on January 27th for either families or youth. And uh, we encourage uh, members of committee and uh, council uh, to uh, try to spread the word. Uh, we've heard about people talking about it in the dog parks and, uh, and people, you know, to, uh, trying to get their neighbors interested in attending some sessions. And we know there are parents out there with interested young people some of whom uh, incidentally may be interested in urban planning, and uh, this will be uh, of, of special interest to them. So I just wanted to mention that we're making a push for this, and it's uh, really important to the project, and I want to take the opportunity to make you aware of it and also enlist your support. Very good. Thank you for the reminder. I'm sure we'll have no trouble uh, passing the message on. Are there any uh, questions or comments? Okay, it looks like we have uh, Manager Wisniak with us. I'm back, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so back to you we go. So we want to provide a few updates uh, further to our November meeting um, when we uh, did some updates on the accessible transit in Collingwood. And then we have a few other things to touch on with our transit study and some of our uh, COVID related uh, ridership trends. So we'll start with the first slide. Uh, next slide, please. And there we go. Yeah. So our Manager, uh, Manager Wisniak, can I just interrupt? Um, I'm getting a real uh, loud echo, so I'm unable to understand you. Uh, are other members of the committee experiencing that? He sounds a little hollow to me, but I can hear him. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we'll. I we'll... can't hear him. Okay. All right. Um, I'm not sure how to rectify that. Um, 
Is, is there some adjustment to your speaker that you could make perhaps? I believe, um, Chair Doherty, that uh, IT is trying to assist. Do you have a headset, Chris? That you could use? No, okay. Well, I can I can walk through the presentation, and Chris can stay on the line, and we can and see if um, he can answer some any questions that come up. That would be great. Why don't we Thank do you. That? We'll just keep things yeah. moving along. So, no problems. So, um, yeah. So, just as Chris started to mention, so one of the aspects that uh, we had brought forward to uh, committee and council in the fall was the. Um, extension of the existing uh, transit contracts. So the Red Cross contract, which is our accessible transit, that uh, was expiring at the end of the year. So this has been extended through March 2021, which was what we had proposed to committee. Mm -hmm. our, our landmark contract, which is our call trans contract, this uh, expires at the end of uh, July in 21. But uh, given the changes we anticipate with the transit study, we are looking to extend that contract by one year. So we're working through the extension letter with purchasing now. And then uh, with respect to our accessible taxi or on-demand accessible uh, transportation, uh, we were able to um, reach an agreement with H ACE CABS. And so they have, um, extended this service and is pro are providing the service to our community for uh, three to four months. We're paying on a, a monthly basis uh, within the budget that uh, was approved by council. Next slide, please. So uh, with respect to the accessible services uh, and the report that we had brought to committee in the fall, uh, we have been working on the request for information uh, for for accessible services. And uh, we hope that this will be released uh, very shortly. And the intent of this is just to assess what the opportunities are out there uh, for uh, providers of accessible um, services and get at some market value and determine the interest. Uh, if we uh, have some good interest, then the intention is to issue an RFP and uh, right now we're proposing that that would probably be an 18 month contract, which would coincide with our extension with the uh, call trans contract. In the meantime, uh, an opportunity came forward through the Provincial Inclusive Community Grants Program. And we submitted an application uh, for a $30,000 grant for an accessible services needs assessment. And we did get some support uh, and partnership uh, from our uh, neighboring municipalities, Blue Mountains and Wasega Beach. So they uh, contributed some letters of support. And, and if we're successful, the accessible services needs assessment will um, include some investigation into uh, providing service to those communities as well. Next slide, please. So the transit study uh, has commenced and uh, Chris is working with our consultant on that. And this was one item we wanted to uh, make sure that uh, committee and council and the public were aware of. So uh, we're, our first round of public consultation uh, will be released shortly uh, this week on the Engage Collingwood platform. And we're looking for uh, just some comments uh, right now, general comments on our current uh, transit service and, uh, you know, any information and good comments that the community can provide. There will be a virtual PIC set in January, and this will be another opportunity for members of the public to uh, provide us with some, uh, some comments. And this will be facilitated by our consultant. So we're hoping that it will um, really promote some good conversation with users of the system. Uh, also, with uh, the virtual PIC, we are reaching out to a lot of uh, stakeholders in our area where um, we know transit, um, they have some interests in the, in the transit service. 
Following uh, the, the receipt of information, the consultant will be uh, working with us and taking that information and working with us to uh, look at the uh, proposed alterations to our transit service and that will be presented to the public uh, at another PIC, which right now we're expecting will be March or, uh, yes, February or March. And following that PIC, uh, the final report will be delivered in late spring. So keep an, keep an eye out for the first round of public consultation this week. Thank you, next slide. Chris is gonna provide an update on our new bus purchases. So we have new, two new diesel buses and they're set to arrive, we're hoping at the end of, end of March, 2021. There was some delays due to COVID, uh, but this is the uh, new schedule we have anticipated with them. So these buses, one, uh, We'll, we'll be taking, two, we're in the receipt of two new buses. We will take two old buses off the road, but we'll be keeping those two buses, keeping one uh, as a spare uh, for if we have a bus that um, is uh, not operating, then we'll, we'll have a bus that we can put into service. And right now we're going to keep the second bus as well for uh, spare parts and see if it, it can be used. It's, it's more valuable to us that way than uh, selling it at this time. Next slide. And uh, Chris was just going to uh, provide some information. Uh, this is our rider ridership. And uh, we're looking at the, uh, the yellow line is ridership data from 2019. And then the red line is our ridership from 2020. So you can see the uh, drop in ridership um, at the beginning of uh, the pandemic in Canada and in our area. And uh, slowly we did see some good uh, recovery of use, but we are seeing that still the ridership uh, is low compared to 2019, um, about 50% low, we're saying on average if we look over the year. Yeah. But we just thought uh, people might be interested in seeing what this looks, the ridership looks like. And I believe that's the last slide. Yeah, if there's any questions about any of these items, I'll do my best to answer. Thank you, Director Slama. Mayor Saunderson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, through you to Peggy. And uh, if um, you can answer, and if not, we'll maybe get Chris back. Well, there he is. I'm just wondering in the transit study, are we looking at some additional uh, intra-municipal routes uh, like extending into in Ottawa, because uh, I think that would be a great linkage and there isn't one there now. And uh, I know there's been discussions with uh, uh, Mayor Measures and others in Clearview Township looking to make that connection. I'm just wondering if that's being factored in or explored during the transit study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, through the chair to Mayor Saunderson. Uh, yes, uh, the Township of Clearview is one of the stakeholders that we will be reaching out and making sure that they're included. Uh, in our transit study and, and in the scope of our transit study, we did uh, speak to uh, looking at coordination with our neighboring municipalities. And, and uh, that was one reason why, because we know there's a bit of interest from, uh, from Clearview. Great, thank you very much. Very good. good. Job, Any other questions? No, can't hear you. Good, oh, okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, okay. That was a terrific update and we will uh, look forward to uh, seeing the results of that initial consult. And um, I'm sure all of us will put out by our own social media, the uh, opportunity for consultations uh, later this month. Okay, so I, oh, uh, CAO Skinner. Thank you, Chair Doherty. I was wondering if I could add one more item. Um, it's uh, because she is here tonight and it is her first day, as I'd mentioned, uh, I'd like to do a brief introduction of our new treasurer, Monica Quinlan, if that's okay. That would be wonderful. Okay, Monica, if you could uh, turn on your camera again, please. Uh, Monica, uh, we'll introduce her more broadly, but uh, we're really pleased to, uh, to have her with us. Uh, she uh, has a history in, uh, in uh, originally private business with uh, uh, the auto industry, where she went through some uh, very trying times 
um, when that industry was being restructured and she had uh, a portfolio that included some things that are very future oriented like information technology. Uh, she has been the, uh, uh, the treasurer of the uh, uh, town of uh, Wasaga Beach and she's also uh, worked in uh, uh, run business uh, providing treasury type services to, uh, to many private businesses, which I think is a wonderful experience for an entrepreneurial town like, like ours, where we, we want to understand and support businesses as they grow. Um, I think that she's having an issue with her video that might be related to the host. So I don't know if the host uh, administrator has the ability to turn it back on. So we're, I'm, I'm very pleased to have her. Oh, there she is. And uh, uh, I don't know if you wanted to say a, a word or two, Monica, but welcome. Thank you so much. And thanks for the great introduction. Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm very excited to be part of the town and um, looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you. We're looking forward to working with you. Okay, um, if there's then nothing further on departmental updates, uh, we will move on to public delegations. Uh, and I believe um, we have at least one uh, with Mr. George Powell, uh, Deputy Clerk, are there any others? Uh, there are a number of people in the audience today. Um, George Powell, if you wanna speak, could you please raise the hand function just to make sure that you're good to go. If not, we also have Matthew Pretty who's also wishing to speak up. George is ready here, so I'll just allow him to speak. Thank you. You should be good. Uh, we're good to go. Mm -hmm. Go Thank ahead, you. Mr. Powell. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, um, what, the reason I'm here this evening is to try to make council, or not council, but the committee aware of concerns the Blue Mountain Watershed Trust has uh, with respect to the Silver Creek and Tongan Creek environmental areas where natural heritage features are present. Um, we submit this as the case with regards to the severance of the 80 Madeline Drive property, which was recently approved by Collingwood's uh, Committee of Adjustment. <clears throat> and it's really not the severance of the two properties we are opposed to, but the stated purpose of the consent which is to uh, essentially allow uh, the service to that area by a boat channel providing access to watercraft into the EP lands, which are really rare and sensitive environmental protected lands in that particular area. And this is the first time uh, we had ever heard that uh, Tom Land Creek be, would be referred to as a boat channel. Now, <clears throat> I just want a little geography if I could. Tom Land Creek flows into West Black Bass Bay, a tongue twister, a creek serving a watershed almost as large as Silver Creek. And it's not even, uh, it's not even considered uh, in the OP, and I feel it should be. In other words, you, you have four creeks that are named, and I think Downland Creek should, should be as well. So it flows out of the town of Blue Mountain, uh, through the Blue Mountain Resorts, the South Hill there, and then it goes into the Montero Golf Course and uh, off down, down uh, across, across um, crosses into Collingwood, south of, at least north of 26th, and then out to the bay. And it runs right between 70 and 80 Madeline. So you have a major, in my opinion, waterway going between those two uh, pieces of those property. Now, Townline Creek, therefore, I consider, as I've mentioned again and again, is, is a major watershed as far as I'm concerned. It lies within the provincially significant Silver Creek wetland. And, it's the, and the, 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 the provincial policy statement prohibits development in a provincially significant wetland. It is shown on the Collingwood Zoning Bylaws map, map one, as environmentally protected land in which development is to be avoided. That's out of, that's, I've taken that out of, your, out of the OP. Uh, <clears throat> it is shown on Schedule B of the committee official plan as category one lands, and lands where there's a heightened need for protection and the development, and, and development is prohibited. It is a fish migration route 
and spawning and protection of fish habitat or, 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 or uh, fish or fish habitat is required under the Federal Fisheries Act and the provincial policy statement. I just, it's hardly the place for a boat chairman. You may recall the Committee of Adjustment previously denied the original uh, request to develop the uh, 70 mountain property. The decision was appealed to OMB and reversed. It seems that the present Committee of Adjustment did not refer to that decision in, their, in, in, in making their decision because it was far more complex than uh, I believe they understood. We know as well, nowhere in the original documentation is a boat channel mentioned. What we fear is the gradual erosion of the natural heritage features, which are significant, and why the wetland is designated as a provincially significant wetland. And it's just not a wetland, it's provincially significant. The, provo the proposed Bridgewater and the Huntington Trails developments serve as potential examples of negative impact on the environment. Mr. Tap Powell, I'm just going to interrupt you quickly to say I'm giving you your one minute warning. Sorry. Thank you. The proposed Bridgewater and the Huntington Trails development serve as potential examples of negative impact on the environment. There are few municipalities in Ontario that have within their official boundaries a rare coastal wetland such as Silver Creek. It needs to be treated and enshrined in the official plan. Despite the Collingwood official plan stating as, as a major focus, respecting, maintaining, and strengthening Collingwood's cherished natural features and the Provincial Act recommending the protection of the peninsula's wetlands. These requirements are being ignored. The International Tan Commission is completing two major studies on the important role wetlands play in coastal resilience and mitigating flood and water quality issues in the Great Lakes, the goal being to identify future threats to the environment before they get started. What we see happening, however, calling was not conforming to the town's official plan, zoning bylaws, Ontario's Planning Act and the Provincial uh, Policy Statement and the recommendations of the International uh, Joint Commission. Thank you. Okay, you're good. You're under the wire. Is there any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Powell. Any questions from the committee? Okay, thank you very, oh, sorry, uh, Mayor Saunderson. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to George, thank you for bringing this to our attention. George, I'm just wondering, was the NBCA involved in the, uh, in the uh, Committee of Adjustments process? No. Uh, Your Worship, uh, the issue you have there is, <clears throat> and Sonia uh, Skinner would understand it. Um, the way it works is uh, the actual uh, uh, con uh, conservation authority that's responsible in that area is in Tomlin Creek is uh, uh, Grace Sable Conservation Authority. And that's the only reason they're mentioned in the official plan. And there is some confusion there because they, the two conservation authorities uh, use different uh, approaches to uh, things like floodplain mapping and so forth. Okay, well, maybe just a, a follow up there, Madam Chair. Yeah. So was there a report then from the Gray Sable Conservation Authority? Uh, I'm just wondering if there was any, uh, my understanding is in these uh, issues, the conservation authorities pro provide uh, biological and uh, natural comment on the natural heritage. I'm just wondering if that occurred in this case or not. Well, I'm sure it must have, but, but it's, uh, your worship, um, the, the issue is not that at all. The issue is that we're not, we're whittling away at, at, a, at a very, uh, the natural heritage features of that area. You've got a provincially significant wetland, which is supposed to mean something, and, and you can't continue, or we should, I don't, it's my opinion, sorry, uh, that, that, that we should be trying <clears throat> to prevent that. And, um, you know, I, it's, a, it's a boat channel. Can you imagine a boat channel in, in an environmental protect that? They don't talk about it. It's the, it's the major discharge of Tarmine Creek. It's the only way it gets out there, and when you get, and when you you have uh, the spring spring freshet where you get you know the water the the, the, qu the quantity of water going through there is huge, and uh, you've got to keep that channel open. You have got it sitting on private property, which most of your other uh, other uh, rivers, at least uh, creeks and rivers, don't. 
when you look at Black Ash Creek, you're wide open there to the bay. Uh, pretty, pretty river parkway. You've got wide open there as well. You can get at it. Battle Creek, you can really get at it too. The, more, the one you can't get at is Stoneline Creek without asking for permission. The environment, you know, can't speak for itself. And what you've got it, what, what I believe we have to do is get calling with citizens and council to do it, or we'll end up with, with uh, the environment being impacted. That's really it, I guess. Thank you. Um, Director Farr, did I, did I see you uh, with your hand up or? Go, go ahead. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I've spoken with this before with uh, Mr. Uh, Powell. Uh, this matter came before a committee of adjustment on December 17th and the appeal period has now uh, uh, passed, which means that their uh, decision is uh, approved and final. So there was a period during which uh, anybody who had an interest could dispute the committee's decision. Um, uh, Mr. Powell uh, is, uh, I guess, reflective of uh, community interest here in Collingwood regarding uh, uh, being protective and careful with respect to development approvals uh, along the shoreline. And uh, it's uh, something that we're aware of. Uh, when this application came forward, we referred this uh, to the Grace Conservation Authority for additional review as part of any application that proposes to alter uh, property lines. And that's what this was. This was an alteration of property lines. It wasn't the creation of a new lot. It wasn't uh, changing the land use status of anything, simply moving property lines. Um, we're able to uh, hold the application for uh, approximately a 30 day review to ensure that we're collecting all the necessary information to make an eligible decision about what's come before us. So that's exactly what we did. And we made contact with Grace Alba Conservation Authority uh, through a number of different ways, both email and ultimately by a telephone conversation. Uh, Grace Alba Conservation Authority was uh, satisfied and, and not concerned that the uh, proposal uh, at Committee of Adjustment uh, presented any uh, fundamental environmental or land use planning uh, concerns. And, uh, and the, the, I guess the sensitivity and care uh, that uh, I think uh, Mr. Powell's asking the town to uh, um, uh, uh, take in considering these matters was certain, uh, certainly considered by the committee. Um, however, the committee, uh, however, but and the committee understood that in this case, the application in nature was not proposing to change uh, use, not proposing to create new lots, but rather to alter uh, property lines. And for that reason, ultimately staff, uh, along with uh, the technical commentary that we received from, uh, from uh, Grace Alba Conservation Authority, um, made the recommendation of support before the Committee of Adjustment was ultimately approved. Madam Chair, can I respond a bit to that? Uh, yes, uh, go ahead, Mr. Powell. Adam, uh, the thing you got to explain to me is the purpose as stated in the notice is to establish a boat channel. It does talk about the severance of the top of thing, but right at the, the purpose of the thing is to establish a boat channel. Putting a boat channel into environmentally sensitive areas, you know, if you want to do it, if the public want to do it, that's fine. I, but, but the Blue Mountain Watershed Trust does not want to see that happen. And that's, that, that's it. So um, you can talk all you want. The Committee of Adjustment, and I was there, Adam, you were not. I was there. And, and, uh, and, and uh, the thing that bothered me was the chair pushed that thing through. The vice chair said it was just a simple severance, and, and it isn't. And that's the issue. And you got to understand, we went through, a, through hell trying to get 70 Madeline uh, not approved initially back in, uh, July, I think it was June. June of 2017 or wherever the hell it was. And, 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 the, and, and the, committee, the Committee of Adjustment did that, they denied it. And now you're turning around saying, well, we can sever the property. You sever the property, you, you make changes to the, you, you impact uh, the, the fact that it lies abuts the provincially, at least the uh, provincially civic, significant wetland. You've got a channel running through there. You don't, know, you don't have it near the uh, clearance that you're supposed to have, the buffer. It's 3.5 meters 
like 10, 12, 10 feet away from the edge of, of Conline Creek. And when that thing floods up, it'll be a pusher. And they've gone in there and they've put so much fill in there, it's unbelievable. And I've spent you know time down there trying to understand what the hell are they trying to do? So I, you know, I'm I'm not going to give up on this stuff. Uh, if I feel that you know that what we're doing is wrong, I'm going to let you know. Thank you, Mr. Powell, and and so you should. Um, are, are there any other? Oh, uh, C. A. L. Skinner. Um, thank you, Chair Doherty. I just was uh, wondering if. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure who is most familiar with this proposal, but with the um, the boat channel being established, I assume that there's no moving of earth or or a construction involved with this uh, proposed boat channel. It is it is simply that the um, the requester has noted that that's what they plan to do, which is to sail crafts there as opposed to build something, but I just wanted to clarify that that I perceived this proposal correctly. Director Farr? Th yes, that's uh, that's correct. Can I just explain to you that we spent 10 years sampling at the mouth of Tomlin Creek. I've walked out there in waders to the mouth of Tomlin Creek, 50 feet offshore. I've taken samples three feet deep and hit my hit my hand on the on the on the uh, on the on the on the shore on the on the bottom. So don't tell me <laughs> you're not going to have to dredge it. You are going to have to dredge it. There's a there's a thing called a, uh, a gravel bar in front of that, and it's been pushed in by you know the high water level. But once that level drops down there, you're going to be in there trying to fish it out, and the, it should never be considered a boat channel. And that's what you, what uh, they, the, the people providing it claim as a re reason. I would like that that whole thing taken out of there. Uh, you know? uh, just to, to be clear, uh, Director Farr, if there were to be any uh, dredging, I would assume that uh, the proponent would require approval from the Gray Sobel Conservation Authority. Yeah, that's that's correct, and and that's and that's why we were uh, cautious about this. Uh, I want to make it very clear that uh, it's a public process, and that uh, and that Mr. Powell's comments were welcome, and that uh, well, like when Mr. Powell or members of his group speak to uh, matters of, of interest that uh, they bring forward, that's an important part of uh, of the mandate of that group in the community, and uh, we listen to them closely. Um, uh, and, and this is also this uh, out of concern for uh, what was proposed in this case. We uh, extended uh, the commenting period to the Gray Sobel Conservation Authority because we wanted to be very clear uh, about what uh, impacts, if any, there will be associated with this uh, application. And, uh, and in fact, yes, if, if there were additional works that were required out there, they would uh, require when you would expect that they would uh, apply for uh, the related conservation authority permits or, or in fact, uh, a DFO permits if they were applicable, the DFO being Department of Fisheries. Right. Thank you. Okay, are there any other members of the public who wish to uh, make a uh, general comment to the committee? Yeah, Deputy um, Clerk. Chair Doherty, uh, there's Matthew Pretty on the line who's wishing to speak again. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Pretty. I just have to promote him here just a second. Okay, are you good, Matt? Yep. Okay, thank you. I've taken my card off so you can see me. Uh, two things. Mr. Powell's worked for a super long time with regards to navigating conservation concerns and the like. There is a fighting spirit about Mr. Powell that's interesting and also strange. I do think access along the shore is important so that we're in harmony. This whole blocking off of areas to go by the shore, I think we need to not be that way. We need to talk about like how to adapt and adopt the shore, but it is a very sensible alluvial plane out there with the estuary that, yeah, it's a very fragile ecosystem. 
such as when I was asking uh, Councillor Doherty just the other day at the Central Park Arena parking lot about the baby turtles. And she said, oh, my goodness, we've got all this other stuff to do. And I don't know about the baby turtles this year. I'm not sure if we can help the baby turtles this year. And I, I really thought that was an interesting statement from a person that's on the board of the NBCA. We don't have time. There's so many other projects. I'm just like, well, nobody supported my motion during the budget process with regards to these baby tur turtles. Uh, Director Culver did state, though, uh, that we could hire a, a consultant, an ecologist consultant, and that's great. And, and Marion McLeod, Councillor McLeod said, yeah, that's what we need to do. If Mr. Powell could be a little more uh, directorial with regards to the consultancy that's required. He seems to be this lone soldier, you know, out panning for gold. And it's like, well, who, who are you to say well, we can and can't do. Like, why don't you give us some names of consultants that can help protect these areas before the seniors go south again? You know, it's just mad. I would like to say, though, that Martin has done a kick-ass job of rallying the downtown. The COVID crisis is insane. I was really alarmed with the banning of barbecues at the, at the water. I, I do think it's a healthy activity to be sitting on the ground, on the land, because when I go down to Harborview Park, I sit and I, and I see things and I connect with nature quietly. And yes, the turtles need to be protected along Turtle Trail. That's ridiculous. Like I found one that we put in the water together. This lady had a smartphone. It was hilarious. Let's just take a video of putting this turtle in the thing. And then I found the dead one along the path. And, and really, that was a heartbreaker. I was just like, damn it all anyways. Like, you know how long it takes to for, for you know, the habitat and the babies and all this stuff, co-creation is so darn important. And I understand where Mr. Powell is going. And I think it's a group effort. I would like to encourage the, the Martin Ridlow, uh, you know, I, I know there's there's ties with other alternative groups and that's fine. You go for it. But I do think we should, we should try to do picnicking in the park, encouraging people to sit down. So if we're doing social distancing next year, Let's encourage people to bring food from downtown at the farmer's market, as Councillor Doherty, you're very aware of, Terry Doherty. Take the food, go to the museum, where are the park locations that you can sit quietly and peacefully, where are the bathrooms? Let's start connecting the dots. When I was in South Korea, you should have seen the people that would picnic in all these places, the mountains, the river, the beaches. they take their trash with them. they do all that. That's what we're missing, guys, is to... A picnic vibe telling people to say hey you can go and sit on the grass and go and enjoy that you know go do that don't you know just just not say don't all the time and i i'm so bad for that you know don't do this and don't do that the seniors are so lonely on long -term facilities i think we need to do a lot of radio ecology is always going to be number one I'm going to interrupt you, yeah, Mr. I understand. Pretty, that's, What's that's my your one-minute warning. Yeah, that's fine. So, biologically, and Councillor McLeod made this brilliant statement, she says, yeah, the, the, the biological thing came from the supposed wet market in China. It's possible. It's also possibly created in a lab. But to tell you the truth, guys, we got to get out and get vitamin D. we got to drink good water. We gotta get proper health. We need to take consultancy from other people and adopt those things. And I am scared that the ski hill is gonna be like, yeah, come on back guys and let's shop and do whatever the hell you want. Well, you know what? That's unacceptable as well. And like Mr. Powell is saying, there's certain areas that are no-no areas and that is true. I'm upset that Martin's leaving. I don't know where he's going, but guys, guess what? Teamwork, teamwork. We need to be a team and all this. And that's what committee's about. We just went through a hell of a process down south. Let's get back on the team level. Let's respect each other. Let's love each other. And let's have a future. Let's pick thank a you. future. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Pretty. That's my Mr. statement Pretty. tonight. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, uh, Deputy Clerk, are there any other uh, delegates? Uh, we do have a couple more people in the audience, so I'll just call if anyone else wishes to speak, if you could please raise your hand. And it looks like uh, there's no one else wishing to speak this evening. Thank you, Deputy Clerk. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that uh, concludes public delegations and we will move on to 
Other business, are there any other items this evening from members of the committee? Okay, seeing none, then we will move on to adjournment. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. Um, motion to adjourn, all in favor? And that is carried. And thank you very much committee and staff and uh, members of the public and have a good evening and be safe.